first scripture is from Psalm 78, 23 through 29. Yet he commanded the skies above and opened the doors of heaven. He rained down on them manna to eat and gave them the grain of heaven. Mortals ate of the food of the bread of angels. He sent them food in abundance. He caused the east wind to blow in the heavens, and by his power he led out the south wind. He rained flesh upon them like dust, winged birds like the sand of the sea. He let them fall within their camp, all around their dwellings. And they ate and were well filled, for he gave them what they craved. This ends the reading of the first scripture. Our second scripture reading um, comes from Exodus, chapter 16. Now, in Exodus is, as you know, the second um, book of the Hebrew scriptures. And from chapters 15 through 18 is the period when the Israelites are wandering in the desert. They've escaped out of uh, really difficult circumstances in Egypt, and then they start the wandering, and it lasts a lot longer than they realize. And so in this section, um, the Israelites are starting to, it's really starting to dawn upon them that they have left civilization and now they are on their own and they start to panic. This is Exodus chapter 16, verses 2 through 4 and continuing with verses 9 through 15. The whole congregation of the Israelites complained against Moses and Aaron in the wilderness the Israelites said to them, If only we had died by the hand of the Lord in the land of Egypt when we, when we sat by the flesh pots and ate our fill of bread. For you have brought us out into this wilderness to kill this whole assembly with hunger. Then the Lord said to Moses, I am going to rain bread from heaven for you. And each day the people shall go out and gather enough for that day. In that way, I will test them whether they will follow my instruction or not. Then Moses said to Aaron, Say to the whole congregation of the Israelites, Draw near to the Lord, for he has, your, he has heard your complaining. And as Aaron spoke to the whole congregation of the Israelites, they looked towards the wilderness, and the glory of the Lord appeared in the cloud. The Lord spoke to Moses and said, I have heard the complaining of the Israelites. Say to them, at twilight you shall eat meat, and in the morning you shall have your fill of bread. Then you shall know that I am the Lord your God. In the evening, quails came up and covered the camp, and in the morning there was a layer of dew around the camp. When the layer of dew lifted, there was on the surface of the wilderness a flake, fine, flaky substance, as fine as frost on the ground. When the Israelites saw it, they said to one another, What is this? For they did not know what it was. Moses said to them, It is the bread that the Lord has given you to eat. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So most of you know... Um, Several months ago, we switched the way that we do communion. It, it used to be that we would pass the plates, and we did started doing this after COVID, which was before I came around. No, I was here. Um, we would pass the plates in the pews. Um, and so now we do it where you have the option of coming forward. You have the option of putting, um, dipping the bread in the cup, doing it by intention, or taking a little cup. Um, I was not the one who made that change. I'm, I'm not shooting responsibility here, but I'm just saying, in the Book of Order, it says that the session alone decides when and how a congregation takes communion. So I wasn't the one who made that change. But I can say this, I have probably benefited the most from that decision. In the past, when we were doing it by passing the trays, I would, I would send them off, 
And then I would just stand behind the table and watch. I could pray, I could meditate, um, and which was meaningful, but I was really kind of an observer. Now, people come forward, and when they approach me, I get to say to them, the body of Christ broken for you, or the bread of salvation given for you. I get to look people in the eye and share this love of God with them. Not something that I'm able to give you, but something that the church gives you, provides for you. And then as God's servant, I get to stand in this holy ground between you and I, with God in between. It's, an, it's the best thing I do in a month, I can tell you. It, it gives me strength. It gives me courage. But as much as I love offering communion to each member here who comes forward, as meaningful as that is, it doesn't hold a candle to when a child comes forward. And it's not just because children do funny things and they're really cute. I mean, like my daughter, Gracie, when she was young enough to still be held, um, her father took her up for communion, and, you know, she grabbed, it was back when we grabbed the bread, and she tore the bread out of, piece of bread out of the, um, out of the loaf, and of course then it was like the objective was to get the biggest piece of bread you could. Um, but she didn't really know what was going on, and, and, and her dad said, you know, there's the cup, there's the cup. And she, so she thought that meant, you know, throw away the cup. So, so she went, Dink, and she made a perfect uh, shot into the cup, and that, that was it. And then a couple, uh, when we did this the first time, I think um, Roxy came up forward. And it was, she was in line, and I think she thought, you know, it's snack line or something. And so she got up, and she thought, well, this it was like she was looking at the tray like, well, that's not hardly enough snack for me. <laughs> so she started grabbing all the cups of the gluten-free bread and taking it off and, with her like this. And we, the teachers had to sort of redirect her. It was hilarious. But kids do all kinds of amazing things during communion, but that's not why... I love watching kids come forward for communion. I love watching kids coming forward for communion because I'm, I'm watching them start to realize that they're participating in a ritual. You and I, all of us adults, we understand communion intellectually. We know that we're, you know, we're acting out this centuries-old story about Jesus um, and we might also understand, well, we're, we're not Roman Catholics. We don't believe in transubstantiation. We're not, we don't believe in the, that the body and blood, this is the real body and blood. Uh, we're also not Baptists. We don't believe it's just, just remembrance. We're Calvinists. We're kind of in the middle. We believe in a spiritual presence in the, in the body. You, you might have all that kind of stuff in mind. You might know the history of it. You might understand communion from a rational perspective. But little children have none of that. If you're a parent or a grandparent and you've brought a child with you for communion, you may or may not explain to them what you're doing. You know, this is the body of Jesus. We're taking it. Or, you know, you might, you might go through that with them. I know the Sunday school teachers go through that with them. But your explanation to them is not likely to make much sense. So most often what I see parents and grandparents doing is just saying, you know, get in line. Dip the bread in. Um, now let's go back to our seats. It's just instruction. They just do the thing. And here's the thing. The real lasting impact of this ritual is lost to the intellect. It is only experienced at a deeper level of awareness. It's, it only can be experienced truly at a level beyond words. It's the movements. It's the eye contact. It's the rhythm of the words. It's the feel of the bread in your mouth. And it's only at this deeper level of awareness that children ever even experience communion. And so for anyone who's ever watched a child come up forward and, and be introduced to the ritual, to watch them be absorbed in it and be absorbed by it, it brings it to life. 
because all it is is the reality of it. Let me be more specific here. I'm not sure what's in the mind of any child, and I'm not saying that all children are the same, but I have made a couple of observations. The first is that children know that when adults are being quiet and solemn as a group, it means something very important is happening. And children feel very important themselves when they're included in that. It says that they are an important part of the community. The second thing I have noticed is that children, because they exist in this world of imagination, they recognize that there is mystery in something that is being performed so formally. This formality, this mystery then for them gives great weight to the words, the bread of life, the cup of salvation. They don't know what those words mean, but they remember them. And finally, and the most important thing I want to say about this is that children, I think youth, but children yearn for multi-generational communal experiences. I mean, children spend their days in school where they're segregated by age. And the adults do a thing, and they do a thing. And church is one of the very few places in our lives where children participate fully with people from all over the age spectrum as equals. And this is really important because it conveys to them that they're safe and secure because they belong to something that's larger than themselves. It's like something in us that is very ancient, like the memory of sitting around a campfire at night after a hunt. You've eaten the meal. Everybody's getting sleepy. The fire is burning. And the elder tells a story. Communal rituals signal that all is well and we are together. And nothing is better for kids than that. Now, I've spent probably half of my sermon now talking about children and their experience with communion. And, and the reason why I wanted to spend so much time on that is, in my opinion, as I said, I think children reflect and tune into the heart of the ritual. But I think the heart of the ritual can also be seen in this passage about manna. Let me explain. So at the outset, like I said, um, the Israelites are in the wilderness. They're wandering. They have escaped from the horrors of forced work camps and brutal oppression and cruel injustice under the Pharaoh. And Moses and Aaron have led them out in this miraculous escape. And yet here they are on the other side. And they're complaining that they want to go back. Why? Because they're human. Finding yourself in the unknown is terrifying. There are no institutions. There are no stores of food. There's no shelter. There's no sense of where you're going or what the future is going to look like. They don't even know Moses that well. All they know is that he killed a man. And they are only just getting to know this God. And when people find themselves in unfamiliar, uncharted territory, they tend to yearn for the familiar past. No matter how bad that past might have been. And so the Israelites complain, if only we had died in Egypt, at least there our stomachs were full. And there's going to be moments in this story when they're wandering in the wilderness when God is going to get frustrated and fed up with the complaining. At some point, Moses is going to have to keep God from, well, you know, 
punishing them pretty severely. But at this moment, God is answering their call. And God responds to their needs with a plan. God says to Moses, tell the people I have heard their cries. And we all know from personal experience what it is like to find ourselves in the wilderness. We all know what it's like to go through times of intense change and uncertainty. Becoming an adult and living on your own, going to college, that's a kind of wilderness experience. Maybe you've experienced the devastation of divorce or the death of a spouse, where all of a sudden you're alone. We can transition from being physically healthy to suddenly feeling our bodies slow down or become handicapped by age or injury or illness. That's a wilderness, too. Everyone at some time in their life will face the unknown and know the grip that fear can take hold of them in those times. The world we're living in, too, is also going through a time of change, not as dramatic as what the Israelites are experiencing. We're not searching for food on the ground. But we're definitely entering into a kind of societal wilderness. Institutions that were once stable and reliable are no longer experienced that way. The technology has changed our lives dramatically. Even just in the last five years, much less the last ten years, and that change has only just begun. Even the weather has changed and is expected to keep on changing. No one knows what the next two years will bring. So for those of us who feel like the congregation of Israel, that we're entering into a kind of wilderness, entering into uncertainty, the words of the Lord are quite comforting. When God says, tell the Israelites, I hear them. God has heard their cries. God knows that they are hungry. God knows they are afraid. And so God responds, not just with food, manna and quail, but God responds to their needs with a ritual. You don't really hear it so much in this passage that I just read, but if you keep reading a little bit further, you go into chapter 17, you'll see it. There are all kinds of rules around manna. Rules about how and when to collect it, how to eat it, how to treat it. For example, they are to collect a certain amount, no more, no less. If they collect more than they're allotted, that portion, that excess portion, will dissolve. If they collect less than they are allotted, their portion will be um, increased uh, to fulfill the portion that they're allowed. And they're to collect it only in the morning. If they wait too long, it will dissolve on the ground. They are to eat all of it before sundown. If any amount remains and it's left overnight, it will be infested with worms. And so all of this forces the people into this simple ritual action that organizes their day. They rise in the morning. They go out together as a whole community. They collect the manna, this gift provided by God. They eat it throughout the day. And the next morning, they get up and they do it all again. And this ritual is unbroken day after day after day until the sixth day of the week. On the sixth day of the week, they collect a double portion of manna. On this, and, and then it's only on the sixth day of the week that if they collect this double portion, it will be preserved overnight. They will wake up and it will not have been infested with worms. And that, that would be the seventh day. On the seventh day, there is no manna to collect. So fortunately, you've got your double portion. And this is Sabbath. This is the day for them to rest. So manna isn't just food, it is a new life. It is a repetitive reminder acted out in community that God is with them. 
God is providing for them. There is no need to hoard or steal or covet. There is enough for today, and there will be enough tomorrow. Manna is the daily reminder that God loves them, God hears them, and God is with them. And you and I have the same ritual. In every time and place, through every change in society, the church has gathered once a week for worship. Even when the whole world shut down, we still manage to gather once a week for worship. And every month, we break the bread. Every month, we say the great prayer of thanksgiving. We start with that familiar refrain when I say, God be with you, and you say, and also with you. That has been said, that refrain has been said for centuries now. These rituals are not just actions that we take to demonstrate to our neighbors that we're Christian. They don't get us into heaven. They don't even make our problems go away. But they're not empty recitations or meaningless distractions either. Just like the Israelites, the rituals that we participate in together center our lives around God shaping us into the people of God. They have been here long before any of us arrived at this place, and they will be here long after we are gone. They order our lives in the midst of chaos, no matter what magnitude of chaos comes. They tell us who we are and whose we are. They are the gifts of God for the people of God. Amen.